Thank you. You may be seated. And you, if you want to pass your communion cups to the aisle, they'll be picked, picked up with that, the basket that's going down there. Good. Thank you. Hey, you know, like, like some of you, maybe many of you, uh, I basically grew up in the church. You have kids that are in children's church or in our Sunday school class. That's kind of where I started my life from the earliest memories I recall us piling into the family car on Sunday mornings, and we headed off to church. Uh, for me, it was a, a great, a pleasant experience. I enjoyed that. I have great memories of that. We were in a good, healthy, uh, Bible-focused church. I had a lot of friends there, both when I was a little kid and elementary school, all the way up through middle school and high school. That was really the, the core group of the circle of my friends, which was really became part of the problem. You see, because I had such a good group of friends at church, uh, occasionally we had a little too much fun together. And we would always, especially when we got into middle school, and junior high, we would sit together on in a couple of rows, and sometime during the church service, it would get a little boring for us. Uh, the pastors would go on and think, oh, this is kind of not really connecting to us. And so we'd get started there on that sometimes on those rows and maybe passing a few notes. Or we would uh, begin laughing at kind of the latest joke one of the kids uh, th- threw out there. Or we might even gasp at somebody's uh, silent but deadly fart, you know, and <laughs> all that stuff. That's what kids do. And it was sometimes we get a little bit out of hand, I, I admit. And on more than one occasion... Uh, I remember that we'd be cutting up a little bit in church and uh, the pastor would slow down in his speaking and his gaze would kind of come over to where we were sitting and then there'd be just this quiet pause for a moment. Usually that caught our attention and we got straighten up and that, that would take care of it and we kind of get back in line and, and would go on and, Sometimes the joke was so funny or the notes were so interesting or the other stuff was so bad, we just didn't quite get the message. And then there'd be this dead stop. And all of a sudden we'd realize nobody's talking. (laughs) And he'd say something like, now, if you young people over here can just listen for a few minutes and get it back together, we'll be fine and we'll be able to go right on. But if not, I'd be glad to have some of your parents come over and sit in the rows and kind of help you get back in line, get it quiet there. Uh, That happened more than once, I hate to tell you, but it did happen occasionally. And I, man, we would get quick to straighten up and and fly right from that that point on. Uh, Just kind of what happens. It's not happened here. I'm thankful for our teens that uh, maybe I'm just more enraptured with enraptured to the kids than my pastor was. I doubt that, but could be. But I was reminded of that little experience this week as I was preparing going through the passage of scripture that we're looking at today as we continue in this letter of Philippians. Because in it, the Apostle Paul kind of does something similar to what my pastor did when I was growing up as a a teenager. Because Paul's just writing eloquently through this letter, and then we come to chapter 4, and he abruptly stops, and he turns his attention to two women in the church who are having some conflict. And essentially, he stops and he calls them out right there. It's like, it's okay, time to deal with the elephant in the room. You know it's there, I know it's there, and I haven't written anything about it, but time to talk about it. As strange as that seems, that's what Paul did in his letter to the Philippians. We've been looking at that letter, as I mentioned, the last month or so. In fact, we'll wrap it up next week. As we've discovered, uh, Paul wrote Philippians from prison in Rome when he was there. He wrote it about uh, A.D. 60. He wrote it to this church that was very special to him. They are closer in relationship. Uh, Paul was in Rome because he'd been preaching the gospel. And Paul was preaching the gospel because he couldn't stop talking about Jesus. And so we've ta- ca- called and titled this series, Taking Life by the Throat, because that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does. He's in Rome in prison. Paul is not about to let his circumstances prison dictate the direction of his life or, or the message he's to preach. And so Paul is committed to God taking his prison and turning it into a pulpit. And that's exactly what God did. 
Every time that his guards would come to him, Paul would talk about Jesus. And many of them believed in Jesus. And so Paul, at the end of his letter, said, some of my guards now send their greetings to you as a church in Philippi because they know you've been praying for me and walking with me through this. And now they're followers of Jesus too. And Paul's given us this great letter because of a wonderful relationship he had with the church in Philippi. They were his closest friends. He planted that church. He loved that church. And here this letter Paul writes to them. And then we come to chapter 4 of his letter. And there's a switch. And we'll pick it up there. Paul addresses this element in the room head on. If you have your Bible and you want to find Philippians, it's in the New Testament. If you're not real familiar with your Bible, about halfway through the New Testament, you'll come to some small books, uh, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. That's right where you want to be. And we're going to be looking at Philippians uh, chapter 4. And here's what Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 2. He said, Now I plead with Euodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended by my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Paul's been writing this letter, and it's almost as in mid-sentence he says, stop. We have to talk about something. We have to address some conflict that's here in the room, in the church. And so he stops and says, I want to talk about Euodia and Syntyche. You think that got their attention? I suspect so. <laughs> I thought it was bad enough for my pastor to call us out as teens as we sat in the row and we were cutting up before the whole church. But at least he didn't use our names. But Paul, for the rest of history, to know, he says, I'm going to put your names in my letter, Euodia and Syntyche. And so now for generations since Paul wrote, we all know those two ladies weren't getting along in church. <laughs> they had some issues. And it's there for everybody to see. And, and I think it's not that Paul was being mean or cantankerous or sticking his nose into something that isn't his business. I think the point is he recognized that something was going on that was serious and it needed to be addressed directly and addressed now. Because Paul recognized how serious discord in the church can be because it can be a deadly threat to the health and the peace of a church. It can derail a church in its direction, all that God's doing there. It can rob the church of its power and destroy a church of its testimony. And so Paul stops his teaching, and he tells him it's time to resolve some conflict with one another right in the church. And he asks the rest of the church to help him, come alongside of them, get involved in helping them resolve this conflict if that's needed. You see, Paul recognized that the church can be attacked from outside and also from inside. We saw his, how he addressed the attack from outside back in chapter 3. Remember, the church was being attacked outside from some folks called the Judaizers, some Jewish Christians who wanted to bring in legalism to the church and say, oh, you have to go through the, jump through these hoops. You have to keep this list of rules in order to become a follower of Jesus. Or once you're a follower of Jesus, you have to keep this list of rules to be a good follower of Jesus. And Paul said, no, that's an attack on the church. Legalism has nothing to do with grace. And Paul addressed that head on. Now he addressed an attack from inside the church. Unresolved conflict, uh, unaddressed discord between these two women. And so he stops and talks about these two who aren't getting along. Before it gets out of hand and damages the health and the peace of the church, Paul says, we have to talk about it. Before it becomes something of a dysfunctional pattern in the church, of refusing to resolve conflict properly. That's how dysfunctions happen in churches. There are healthy churches a, a decade ago that are no longer in existence or are limping through life or are dead. They just haven't had the funeral service yet. And it usually happens because there was some issue in the church that was overlooked and it became part of their DNA, an ingrown dysfunction of the church. And Paul says, no, we need to stop and <laughs> 
address this unresolved conflict before it becomes one of your systemic dysfunctions as a church at Philippi. You know, that's a good reminder for our church as well. We're gonna, I'm going to introduce you to, for those of you who maybe haven't met, uh, Daryl uh, Evitz, our founding pastor. He's going to be sharing at the end of the service for a few minutes as he comes back over from City Church. But God used Daryl to plant this church uh, some, almost 11 years ago. And throughout its history, our church has had very little interpersonal conflict. Very few issues that have really come up and caused great turmoil or dissension in the church. Really only probably two or three of those have happened. And I think one of the reasons that's been, we've been blessed by that is because early on the leadership of this church decided we're going to deal with conflict. We're not going to ignore it. We're not going to sweep it under the carpet. We're not going to walk away from it. We're going to deal with it lovingly and biblically, and we're going to resolve it whenever it comes up. And so we do. We take seriously the charge of the Bible, the New Testament, that the church is to maintain, not create, but maintain the unity of the church and the bond of peace. That's what Paul wrote. And so we take seriously that, that we need to maintain and be diligent to maintain that peace and that tranquility in the church because that's what Jesus prayed for. But we have to, in order to do that, we have to deal with conflict when it comes up in the church. And so... I want you to know we do that, and we have done it, and we will do that. I tell you also then, if you're engaged at any time, you're at Frontline in some significant conflict with someone else in the church, I want you to know that we're going to call you out publicly on Sundays from now on. <laughs> in fact, we're going to print your names in the church newsletter, just, just like this. We want you to know you've you got to get along here if you're going to be here, okay? I feel the Spirit of God moving somewhere? <laughs> no. That's not, not, thank God, nothing's uh, going wrong at home right now. We're both <laughs> unified on that. But, you know, if you experience conflict and disunity in the church that can't be resolved, I want you to know you can bring it to our attention, not as a tattletale, not telling on somebody, but you can say, we're stuck. I'm stuck. Can you help us learn how to resolve some conflict? You can invite us to do that. And, and I'll tell you, when we're not invited and, and we come and we understand that there's conflict in the body, we'll take some steps to intervene there too and to offer our help because we must protect the unity of the church. Jesus asked us to. Paul instructed us to. We've got to get involved to teach people that they can, we can be attacked from outside, but we can also be attacked from inside. And that often happens through a discord in relationships, unresolved issues. That's a good policy to follow in the church. That's why God, I believe, one of the reasons he's blessed Frontline with a, an absence of conflict for the most part throughout its 11 years. It's also a good policy to find and follow in other areas of relationships in life, both at home, among friends, where you work, in your extended family. Neglecting conflict and not resolving it biblically and properly will produce relational dysfunction. It will do it for you personally. It'll do it in your family. It'll pass it on to your kids. It's a, there's no, no, no win in that kind of thing. And so it's critical that we learn, we go through life learning how to fight fairly. I get it. Discussions, discord, it happens. It happens to all of us, me too. But we have to learn how to deal with it and fight fairly so that we come at it with conflict resolved. So we come out of it with peace, God-honored, a win-win situation. That's critical for us in order to have healthy relationships at home and at work and in our lives and in our church, and we want to do that. And so with that issue of conflict now raised, Paul put it in writing, he proceeds to give some good advice about how conflict can be avoided, or, or if not avoided, how at least can be properly dealt with so it can be resolved once and for all. We come to that, and he continues writing in verse 4. He says, Now rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
With those words, Paul comes back to one of his favorite themes of Philippians. He loves to write and talk about joy, rejoicing. He mentions that topic, that word, some 15 times in this short letter. We read the same words back in chapter 3. Remember he said in verse 1, rejoice in the Lord. Paul wants us to live a life of rejoicing in Jesus. And I suspect that here at this point in the letter, he came back to that theme with Euodia and Syntyche in mind. He thought these two women needed to get their conflict worked out so they can get back to living joyfully in, with Jesus. Because they can't be joyful, they can't be rejoicing in Jesus when they have unresolved conflict between them. And the church will be affected by that. And so Paul says it's time to talk about that. He says that the way you get back to that, to rejoicing in Jesus, is he says you let your gentleness be evident to all. That's an interesting phrase. The word translated gentleness is a, a difficult word to translate with a, a single English word. Uh, the Greek word means more than just that one, one word we can capture in English. Uh, the old King James translated it, let your forbearing spirit be evident to all. The New International Version that I just read uh, translates it, let your gentleness be evident to all. The word carries a, a rich heritage and meaning. Something along the lines of a, a sweet reasonableness. Let your sweet reasonableness be known to all. Your, your great, gracious spirit that comes from authentic humility in your heart. Paul says that's a, a key to resolving conflict. It's, it's a key to experiencing rejoicing, joy in Jesus. And you see how that character quality would help resolve conflict? Absolutely. I think that's exactly what Paul had in mind here. Because he goes on to say, let your, re sweet, your sweet reasonableness be known to all. That everyone, in other words, all will perceive and experience your gracious spirit. How can you have conflict when between two people that are letting their gracious spirit, their sweet reasonableness, be expressed in their relationship to each other. Uh, don't you think if we followed that little bit of advice that probably it would take care of 80% of interpersonal conflict in the church, at work, and at home? Just a little sweet reasonableness. So what do we do with the other 20%? If 80% can be taken care of, well, Paul tells us what you do with the rest. In verse 6, he said, don't be anxious about anything, even the 20% that's left over. He says, but in everything, every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. He said, if you still need to vent about something, even after you've been sweetly reasonable and it hasn't resolved the, the conflict, Paul says, then bring it to God. Vent to God because he can handle it. He can deal with it. He's not going to accuse you. He's just going to receive it and speak back to you about what to do next. And Paul says, keep bringing it to him. Whatever it is, whether it's conflict, unresolved, whether it's beyond that, maybe it's a, a burden you're carrying. Maybe it's a fear of your life. Maybe it's something you're just tired of carrying some stuff. He says, whatever it is, bring it to God. He says, then watch what will happen when you do that. In verse 7, he said, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you've ever been involved in some unresolved conflict, <laughs> me too, we all have, beyond winning, beyond getting one up on the person you're in conflict with, what you really want is just peace to return to your heart. You just want to get rid of this gnawing sense that it's not finished yet, not settled. And so Paul gives us this awesome promise, how to get the peace of God. It's like he says, let, let God know your problems so that people will see your peace. <laughs> just let God know. You can vent to him, and you can leave it with him, He'll show you what to do next. You do that, and 
peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. When you're locked in conflict with someone or, or over something, it doesn't matter. He says, just bring it to God in prayer and leave it with him, and he'll take it from you, and he'll give you his peace in your heart and mind. Sign me up for that. I need that. I've been in places where I'd say, I'd give anything for that. And God says, well, here it is. <laughs> Do that, and I'll show you how to get your way through this. So is there an issue you haven't been able to resolve? Maybe it's so close to home, it's an issue between you and your spouse. He said, yeah, even today, I know deep in my heart, it's not over. It's not resolved. We're at peace, we're not fighting, we're just not talking. <laughs> but it's not resolved. Or conflict with a friend, it's tearing at that relationship, and you know it's not been settled. We're no longer fighting about it, at least outwardly, but our hearts are still at war with each other. Is there a problem at work that's eating at you that just hasn't been settled yet? Paul says, just remain gracious. Just sweet, be sweetly reasonable with one another. And then bring it to God. Leave it to him to take care of and to give you your peace. We all say, we'll take that. Sign us up. We need that in our lives and our relationships at various times. Some maybe even need it today. He says, that's what will happen if you bring it. And then with your heart and your mind at ease, at ease and filled with God's peace, you can focus on the things that will preserve your peace, to keep and maintain the peace. And we find that in verse 8. And he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I love that verse because it calls me back to the virtues that ought to fill my mind continually. Those virtues that make a difference in life. You see, from a biblical perspective, our minds are critical. That's one of Paul's themes in Philippians about our minds. And that's why Paul wrote in another passage speaking about that, of our journey of being transformed into the image of Christ. Paul wrote about the importance of our mind. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he wrote this, And do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Transformed, he's talking in the context, transformed in the image of Christ, like we talked about last week, by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, one of the ways we allow our minds to be trained, to be transformed, to be disciplined, is we allow them to dwell on the right things, the virtues of life, the right thinking habits. If you wonder, well, where do you start with that? How do you do that? Paul says, here's a pretty good list to start with right here. Take these things and train your mind to dwell on those. He says, we are whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. We might say, whatever is morally and spiritually excellent, learn to think about those things. Focus your mind, your thoughts, your heart on those virtues, and they'll make a difference. They'll preserve your peace. Do you think if Euodia and Syntyche had been doing that that their differences might have melted away? I suppose so. I think that's Paul's point. That would have helped them resolve conflict. If they had done a little more venting to God than about one another, to anybody that would listen, more sweet reasonableness had been exhibited between them, their hearts would have been at peace, Paul says. Instead, their relationship was at war with one another because they just refuse to follow the instructions of how to resolve conflict biblically. And so it is with us in our church and in our relationships. Uh, that's a way of life for us. We want to be people who discipline our minds to think about the things that make for peace. Paul says that's critical. 
And that way of life is really more than just a, a positive mental attitude. Sometimes we think it stops there. No, he says that's an attitude that can be lived, practiced, imitated. You don't just ponder it. You practice it. You do it. You identify someone who's doing it, who's an example of it, and you copy them. That's what Paul says right here. Look at verse 9. He says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be worth with you. Some great implications for that. Do you want your kids, you want to teach them how to resolve conflict with each other, with their friends at school? You want to teach them how to do that? Paul says, well, let them see you doing it right. That's a great lesson to learn. That'll teach them. Let them find somebody who's doing it right and pattern it right after that. You want your kids to be pure in their thought life and prayerful with their problems? Paul says, show them by how you do it. You want them, your daughter someday to be able to resolve conflict with her husband? Show her in how you resolve conflict with your husband. Paul says, that's what you do. You find somebody who's doing it, and if you can't find anybody, he says, follow me. I've been trying to do that, and watch how I've done it, and put it into your own life. Do you have somebody that's modeled that? Maybe in your family, maybe it's in a marriage, you say, I never had that modeled at home. And, and that breaks my heart, and I know that's so true. I know people that are married, and they say, I, I never saw how a marriage should work in a healthy way. Find somebody you can watch do it. And come alongside of them and say, do you mind if I just become your shadow, and could you mentor me and show me how to do that? Because I don't know what it looks like to be a good husband or a good wife. I've never had a, a healthy relationship with a mother or a father. I'll just find somebody who has that and imitate them. Let them teach you how to resolve conflict in a healthy, biblical way that glorifies God and brings peace to your heart. And he says, then the peace of God will be imparted to your home and to your heart. That's because Paul teaches us a great truth here. So the, I put it in words like this, that when the peace of God guards your heart, our, our hearts, God's peace will guide the church. Paul says God's peace is something that comes within us, and then it's expressed through, through us in the church. But it begins in those relationships that we find peace and resolve the conflict that's there. If you've ever been to Israel, you probably visited the, the Church of the Nativity, in Bethlehem. It's a great church, great place to see. And there's a little story about that church that should have remained little, but it didn't. It had big implications. It was related to the rights of uh, the Christians that were, the Christian minorities that were living in the Holy Land back in the 19th century. And it seems that the, the church site was owned by the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. And they got along with that. But then one day, the Roman Catholic Church decided to take down the silver star that was on the church and to put up their own star. Well, the Greek Orthodox congregation didn't like that. In fact, they refused to allow it. And conflict became the issue. There was a schism that developed. The Greek Orthodox Church happened to be supported by Russia. The Roman Catholic Church was supported by the, by the French. But the Ottoman Empire of Turkey... They actually controlled Palestine at that time, and so they, Turkey sided with the Roman Catholic Church and, and France. Well, it continued to be unsettling. It prompted Russia, among other things, to declare war on Turkey. And France, followed by England, they declared war and allowed, allied themselves with Turkey, and they declared war on Russia. And so they all decided, we're going to go to war. The history of that war is known as the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856. Nation against nation. One of the factors that all came back to was an unresolved conflict in the church. So much so that at the end of the war, 
There was no longer a star above the church of the nativity. Paul says, you see the consequences of unresolved conflict? They're serious. They can destroy churches. They can destroy relationships. They can destroy families, friendships. It's a pretty ugly story of what can happen when conflict goes unresolved. And peace is preempted by discord because we refuse to address it or don't know how to address it. The lesson that Paul leaves with us is an important one, that when the peace of God guards our, ha- our hearts, then God's peace will guide our church. If you're involved in some kind of conflict and you haven't been able to resolve it, we want you to know we're here for you. We're not going to call you out on it. We're not going to print your name somewhere. We're, we're here to help you. We're here to say, let's take some steps of how to resolve that and let God bring healing and peace in that relationship. And you discover that peace comes with the relationship peace comes to your hearts as well and to your home. If we can help you with that, we'd love to know and love to do that. In fact, at the close of our service, our our prayer team will be up here at the front and uh, they'd they'd love to pray for you. If you want to talk to them about that or the next step or our counseling ministry, if we can help you in that, uh, let us know how we can do so. Let's close in prayer and I think if, uh, let me introduce Daryl if he's here, but otherwise we'll close and be finished up here. God, thank you. Thanks that you understand about conflict. Your son endured all kinds of conflict, broken relationships of people that didn't love him, didn't even like him. And he was the most reasonably uh, gracious person and sweetly reasonable person of who ever lived. And so we all know we're going to have conflict. But we pray, God, that you teach us and show us how to be a church and to be people that resolve it and listen to you, and would you just nudge us and speak to us and then shout to us if we're not listening. We need to allow you to bring peace in those relationships. Thanks for all you're doing here at Frontline. God, I pray for each one here today. I know you've had a word for each one, whatever it might be, and and I pray for those that don't really know who you are, but they want peace in their hearts, that they might take a step today closer to having that solved, of knowing that Jesus died for them on the cross to bring peace with you. Thanks for our time together today, God. We're grateful for it, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here today. Our prayer team will be up here at the end, at the close of the service. If you want to come up and have some prayer, they'd love to do that. Cafe will be open. Uh, Hang around. Let us say good morning to you. God bless you. See you next Sunday.